Hello everyone, let's begin with chapter one. Um, in this short video we'll cover section one which introduces chapter one. The chapter goals that we have is at the end of this chapter you'll want to be able to define economics which is actually kind of a tough thing to do but we're going to try our best. Two, examine three coordination problems that all economies must solve. Explain how to make decisions by comparing marginal cost and marginal benefit. This will be a very important thing that we'll use throughout the class. Define opportunity cost and explain its relationship to economic reasoning. Okay, opportunity cost is probably one of the top ten things I want you to remember ten years from now. So this is a very important concept. Chapter goals explain real world events in terms of economic forces, social forces, and political forces. So one of the Smartest things I think I ever heard Alan Greenspan say, Alan Greenspan is a former Fed chair, uh, was that there's sometimes there's more to life than economics. And this is true. When we, as economists, we tend to focus on economic forces, but there's more stuff out there, and it's important to look at um, the world in terms of its completeness rather than just the little bit that we study about it. And we want to distinguish between microeconomics and macroeconomics. Of course, this is a course in macroeconomics, so we're going to spend most of our time talking about macro. But we have to spend the first, oh, couple of chapters covering some micro concepts that we use for macro. Finally, positive economics versus normative economics. Um, and also art versus science. Um, Art of economics is really the practice of economics. The science is where we really know what we're doing. And so we need to talk a little bit about where the two meet. So, let's begin. What is economics? So here's a definition. Economics is a study of how human beings coordinate their wants and desires given the decision-making mechanisms, social customs, and political realities of society. Ah, that's a mouthful. Another way to think about this is that economics is the science that studies how human beings try to best satisfy their unlimited wants and desires with limited resources. In the context of a society and with political realities and social customs and um, all the other stuff that goes into our economic decision making. But no matter what economic system we use, and no matter what our political, societal, um, social situations are, we essentially have three coordination problems that any economy must solve. And what do I mean by coordination problem? Well, essentially, it means getting the right stuff to the right people at the right time. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to know what and how much to produce. So we need to know what stuff to make and how much of it to make. Two, we need to know how to make it. So do we make all of our stuff by hand or do we use robots and machinery to um, produce um, goods? What's better? Well, actually, it depends. There are economies where they're still predominantly use manual labor. There's economies like the U.S. who use a high degree of capital in their um, production. So we need to show, make this decision of how to produce it. And then finally, quite possibly the most difficult of these, is who gets it? For whom do we produce it? How do we distribute that wealth? If we take a look at world distribution, we see some pretty startling facts. Um, for one thing, uh, the United States accounts for the top 50% of the top 1% of income earners in the world. Um, and to be in that top 1% of income earners in the world, well, you really only have to earn about 40 grand a year. Um, so we can see hugely um, um, unfair distributions of wealth. Now, does that mean that we should just, oh, well, let's just split it all up evenly amongst everybody in the world? Well, that might not work either. So this is a pretty complicated question. How do we get the stuff to the people who need it? Um, and then also, how do we reward um, people with stuff who actually produce it? Um, so there's some very complicated questions in that um, last bit. 
And why is it so complicated? Well, those three coordination problems exist pretty much entirely because of scarcity. All right, so this is okay in that top 10 list of things I want you to remember 10 years from now. So write this down. Scarcity exists when we want more than what we have. All right, scarcity doesn't mean there's a small amount of something. You could have a ton of something and it still be scarce. All right, all that you have to have for scarcity is to want more than you have. So it means that goods are available are too few to satisfy individuals' desires. Well, that basically goes back to this idea that we have unlimited wants and desires um, and only limited resources. So we have to figure out how to best satisfy that with these scarce resources. Uh, the degree of scarcity is constantly changing, of course. Um, so, for example, let's take um, a market that we might all know about, and that's gold. Now, gold seems to be pretty precious. It's a precious metal. There's not a whole lot of it. But, you know, it actually fluctuates in scarcity. Well, on one hand, we could. We actually do mine more gold, and we find more gold. And as we find more gold, there's actually a larger supply. Um, which means it might be less scarce. But that's actually not the big driver behind scarcity of gold. Driver behind scarcity of gold is demand. How much do we want? So in recent history, we've had a lot of financial uncertainty. And whenever we have a lot of financial uncertainty, that tends to make people want to buy more commodities and things that they think are safe, like, for example, gold, um, which has made gold relatively more scarce. And if you've watched gold markets of late, you notice that the gold price is actually really, really, really high. In fact, I probably wouldn't buy gold myself because it is kind of high. Um, so that's, that's an example of scarcity and how it changes. Um, the quantity of goods and services and usable resources depend on technology and human actions. So, let's take a step back and let's review what this word technology means. So, to an economist, technology means how we make stuff. I know, to an ordinary person, you think of technology, I think of my cell phone or my computer or my Xbox. Well, not so much. When we think of technology as an economist, we think of the application of knowledge. So, what does that mean? That means I have inputs, they get put into this box called technology, shaken up a bit, and out come outputs. So, for example, a factory might be an example of technology. Um, a really neat example of technology I saw, I read in a um, recent issue of The Economist, was a, a new machine which basically you put raw materials in one side and it spits out this prescription drug out the other side. Um, just this box. You, you supply it with power and the raw materials and boom, it, put, it spits out the drugs, which is really cool for places that maybe are hard to get to. Um, and other places for distribution, this might be really fun. This is something that's um, currently in development. So that's one example of technology. And then human actions. Well, we have labor. So usually we think about what are the two main inputs into production. That's capital. So you can think of all the factories and plants and tools that we use to make things. And then labor. So even in the most highly mechanized plant, we still have some labor that goes into running that plant. Um, and so we put those two things together, and that helps us determine how much we can produce. All right, so uh, economics, like any field, evolves and changes. Of course it does. We've had a lot of change, actually. Economics is a fairly young science. It's only about, say, 300 years old, um, and we've had a lot of development. In fact, macroeconomics really only develops as a science in and of itself um, in the 20th century, so it's even younger, maybe 100, 120 years old. Uh, modern economics is based on both uh, this deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. All right, so let's talk about this just a little bit. So deduction is like Sherlock Holmes. All right, we go from the general to the specific. So for example, we have a cow. All right, and all cows moo. All right, that's the sound a cow makes is moo. And therefore, if I hear something, if I see a cow... 
then I'm going to assume it moves. Why? Because all cows moves. So the general principle is all cows moves. Therefore, if I see an individual cow, a specific cow, I know it moves. That's deduction. Right? Induction takes the re reasoning and reverses that. It goes from the specific to the general. All right, so for example, I see a herd of cattle. There's 20 cows out there in the pasture. They're all mooing. And because I see 20 cows that moo, I'm going to assume that all cows moo. So I get this general principle from the specific. Now, deductive reasoning is much, much more powerful than inductive reasoning. All right, when I go from the general to the specific, if I know all cows moo, then if that's a cow, I know it moves, period. But on the other hand, if I go from the specific to the general, just because I see 20 cows that moo doesn't mean there isn't one cow out there somewhere that doesn't. Right? So the general principle that I draw from an inductive um, analysis may not be correct. Right? So why don't I just use all deductive reasoning? Well, the problem is we can't. So, for example, a lot of economics takes and looks at empirical work or evidence. So we take data, economic data, and we try to draw um, conclusions from the patterns we see in that data. That's inductive reasoning. So we're going from specific to the general. Well, there's a probability we're wrong. And as part of that, we have a whole field called econometrics, which is a branch of statistics, which tries to calculate and figure out, well, how far wrong are we, and what's the probability that we are wrong, and how do we minimize that probability? Um, so we have to use both, mostly because sometimes we can use deductive reasoning, but oftentimes the only tools we have are inductive. Then we have abduction, which is the combination of both deduction and induction. And my research, I try to do this as much as possible. So I try to develop a model where I'll prove mathematically some point, and then I'll try to use the data to try to establish that point. All right, so I'll try to develop in theory something that's true, and then I'll try to use the evidence to try to support that to test it. So as close as we can come in economics to conducting an experiment. And that'll do it for the introduction. Um, welcome to macroeconomics.